we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I'm your host, Fadi Kudair. And we are joined today by one of my favorite people at the gym. Oh, that's sweet. Antonio Pinero yeah. from Ingressive Capital. Capital. Yeah. So <laughs> what's the process like for you guys to evaluate a certain company? I want to give you, I can't give you all my secrets. I, I, just, you know, high level. <laughs> um, so we have a, we have a what, five stage process. We first do initial pre-screen just to see if you are, what the business is doing is in line with our thesis. That's the first part where we look at, okay, what geography you're playing, what industry you're playing, how big is the TAM, as, like what's the total adjustable market size, sorry, shouldn't use abbreviations, <laughs> what's the total, um, total adjustable market, what is the scalability of your product, what is your traction? So are you just starting off? Do you have, like, are you generating revenue? Are you growing customers? What does that look like? And then once you pass this pre-screen, we then take into like our diligence phase where you meet when we go through an interview with you. We ask you questions, try to get a feel of who you are, where you've been, what your business is trying to solve for, go through your pitch deck. If you pass that, then you share your data room with us, and we then dig into it. So that's when we go over your financials. We look at the market research. We talk yeah. to people who know you, try to understand, you know, is this business as good as it is? We talk to sector experts. Um, talk to your customer. After the diligence process, we then invite you. If we pass that point, you invite us to an investment committee. At which point we bring in an expert in your sector, professionals that we know that are familiar with the sector, and then you go to like a, a panel interview where we ask you all questions about your business and everything, risk assessment, and after the committee then votes on if we should move forward or not, and at this point we then make an investment. So when you say votes, how, <clears throat> how many folks are involved in that process, like just as an idea? So we have five, actually. So a five-person committee. Our general partner has like and overrule every listen, but it's more about half the time is to get different perspectives. What well, time I mentioned earlier, like diverse teams, we want to make sure that okay, is there anything that we've missed that somebody might have a different opinion, can, yeah, different opinion on? And sometimes after the investment committee, we still go back to the founder to get just more clarity because we're writing sizable checks and we want to make sure that this is the right path for us. So we take our diligence process very, very, very <laughs> seriously. And there are times when after this, we get to this point, we might just, we might make an investment. That's one option. We could just pass or we can monitor, which is, you know, we identify that there are these six risks associated with your business, address it, and come back in like six months and let's see if we can. Mm -hmm. And the BGMF for the founder is like, whether we invest or not, we provide resources to help them grow. So whether it's frameworks, whether it's connections, whether it's like whatever we can, because we want that business to be successful mm -hmm. regardless. So going back to those three different stages, like basically, yeah. sorry, not the stages, but the yeah. results, like yeah. whether you invest or you monitor mm -hmm. or you pass, Yeah. what are the percentages looking like for you guys? Like how many businesses do you enter? Like let's just say out of a hundred, what would that look? <laughs> so we roughly 2,000 applications a month. Wow. <laughs> That's a ton of applications to go through. We probably write one deal every two months. It's a very, very low, low percentage. Yeah, or, very low percentage. So, yeah. Which I I guess a part, portion of it, because you do have the, those stages, right? Like five or six stages that you get yeah. to go through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously at each stage you're losing, there's a lot of attrition coming. There's a lot of attrition. People come and then we, to like one every second month, that's that. But then we also have like a portfolio, like we have a model that we're working with. So while the company might be perfect and everything, the question we, we always ask, and I always ask the question is, if we invest in this company, what does it look like three, four years from now? Is it going to return what we expect it to? Mm -hmm. right? So we're really looking at the financials. So there's some companies that come in and they're great, but their valuations are too high. So we're going to pass. Mm -hmm. There's some companies that come in, group come in, but the valuations are, it's too early for us. So we can't, like, we're not going to make that investment because we're not going to give them the support that they need. Yeah. Because you don't want to give them too much money too early on because yeah. they can get complacent. Yeah, it's, it's very, very <laughs> like, a, extremely similar to banking in one way, mm -hmm. but you're taking on a thousand percentage more risk yeah. compared to what the bank <laughs> is, is willing. Which will, and how we mitigate that risk is beyond the investment. So post-investment, we do provide support. So we take a, we take a customer success approach to it. So we see every portfolio company we're invested in as a client. So once we make the investment, we have a, like a six-month onboarding process. 
And during that onboarding process, we, you know, set expectations, you know, get reports. And then we put in like, because we've done an analysis of what the problems we see in the business are, we then spend the next six months looking to mitigate those risks. Yeah. So we take that approach and we only expect to support the business for the first 18 months. Like that's rigorous one-on-one to get them where they need to be. And then we kind of just take a more of like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Backseat sort of approach, yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about that sort of 18 months mm-hmm. period that you're, you know, heavily invested in a way. Let's just put yeah. it that way. Mm-hmm. When I say heavily invested, it's like a yeah. unintended. <laughs> <laughs> tell me a little bit more about that process and what sort of support do you guys give? Oh, it's it ranges. So I'm just going <laughs> to give an example. So some of it, so let's, one could be, okay, fine, you have this great business, but you're not, you're trying to meet customers. So business introductions. So yes, yeah, so you just like, can you introduce me to these different companies that will use my product? Yes. But before I introduce you, let's clean up your brand. Yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. clean up your pitch deck. Let's look at how you sell. Like, and then how do you validate, like, what is your sales process? So how do you pre-qualify this person? Who do you need to speak to? What is your strategy after you sell? Because oftentimes when you're selling to like a large company, the CEO will sign off. Like, I love this idea. But if you work anywhere, like we know the CEO doesn't execute. So it's like, what is your relationship like with the procurement team? What's your, 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 if it's technology, what's your relationship like with the technology team or product team that's going to implement your tool? Mm-hmm. So we kind of train them through that on like that sales process if the sales is an issue. For some of them, it's more of like product market fit. Yeah. So they have multiple products. What's the right product? So connecting them with a product expert to help them streamline that in line with what the market needs. Because oftentimes it's not about what you think your product, your product might be great, but is it the right time for the market, right? So yeah. kind of help them run through that life cycle to make sure that they are going to the market at the right time and also not getting distracted by too many products because sometimes you want to say, oh, I have 10 products. Yeah, but only two are viable. So cleaning that up. One really common one is recruitment. So most times when <laughs> the we reinvest money, the next thing you hear is, oh, I want to get a CFO. I want to get a COO. And it's more like, well, your company is not the level where you need a CFO or COO. It's too early for that. You probably need, you need an accountant. You need an accountant, <laughs> right? There's a contractor that you're yeah. paying full time. Mm. <laughs> or you need an operations manager, yeah. right? So helping them really look at Or the a heck virtual heck CFO, something like that. Yeah, but like just something that doesn't take all the money you just raised, right? Exactly. So helping them just manage that recruiting strategy so they don't burn the money away really quickly and just kind of close those gaps. And for some, it's, it's really just just networking. So we want to get into this 10 businesses and this one regulator is a pain. How do we get this bank and license so we can provide the service? So connect them to our partners. We can help them get those reg- those licenses and also introduce them to these other businesses. And we don't go in alone. So you're not the investor. So while we might be the first check in, the company might still be looking to raise additional funds. So we then introduce them to venture capital firms that we work with that can come in and close around and just make it easier. Mm-hmm. So, so what type of companies do you normally evaluate for you guys? So, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. not every company. Is- not every, no. So we have, uh, we focus on three pillars, fintech, wellness, and marketplace. Because we aim to invest in businesses that help close the GDP gap on the continent. So fintech is pretty self-explanatory. Anything that you do with remittances, wealth management, transfers. We stay away from crypto. This is not something that we're strong at. Um, we do see the potential there, but we don't do crypto wellness uh, because you no know, health insurance, mental health, food tech is something that's coming up as people are earning more money. Yeah. So that's something that we focus on. And the third one is marketplaces, and this is one I'm most excited about uh, because a marketplace is literally connecting the buyer and seller. So we invest in logistics companies, agritech companies in that space because what we're seeing now is since COVID. A lot of people are looking for how do I connect to a job abroad or how do I get this product to me? So we look for companies that are trying to close. So one of the companies we recently invested in is an older fulfillment service. And thankfully, because of the internet, you have people ordering from Amazon, Tommy Hilfiger, the likes from Nigeria. Well, Tommy Hilfiger, Amazon, they don't have warehouses or trucks locally. So how do they solve that? So this company literally does that they have like an airbnb approach where they've listed all the trucks and warehouses available and they're connecting them to companies like amazon looking to fulfill orders on the continent 
Amazing. <laughs> so that's something that we're... And, and that's a, the cool thing to... Yeah, I find quite often is like when you don't define your niche or like the, the market that you want to go after, it mm-hmm. becomes a little bit hectic for you to, yeah. you're going kind of like flying by the seat of your pants up road. Yes, which is why like a lot of companies do fail. Um, a lot of companies do pivots. And, and I got to see this firsthand on Della because uh, then when Andela started, they were training people over a two-year period and then embedding them in U.S. companies as full-time software engineers, which was great. Right, and at that point, we had a lot of people on the bench, and I remember internally there was this buy versus build conversation. We were like, "We have over a hundred thousand engineers. Why can't we build our own products? Why are we buying stuff? Listen to this." And our CEO was like, "The founder was like, look, our business is, you know, collecting talent with opportunity. We are not a product company. So even if we have this talent, it is a distraction to start building." Yeah. And he was firm about that. Nobody was happy about it, but it was very firm. But because of that focus on this is what we're doing, in time we had to pivot away from training people. And we've actually led us to go fully remote. So we took our six offices globally fully remote. And we focused on our job, which is just connecting talent to opportunity. And this is how they got to unique status, right? Speaking of, of that, so... That's a company that you're still part of, Andela. That's a company I, I was part of that I left, and then I joined Ingressive Capital. Yeah, I was there for five years. Felt like twenty, <laughs> yeah. because in the startup, it's it's that rigorous, and I learned a lot. And I thought to myself, how do I take this knowledge and bring it back to the continent? Because if you are in the U.S. or in Canada, the West Side world, you can read about Google, you can read about Facebook or Meta, you can read about. Oracle, like there's so many stories of success and what it looks like, but the African context is very different. So I wanted to share my experience and bring that thinking to the companies on the continent because, you know, yes, you know, we're building for, like, at the point, and this is not now, but back in the day, is like we're building for 10 million users, right? And then you have engineers who start coming to the U.S. We're like, hey, we're building for a billion users. And they're like, wait, what? So it's just that mindset change. So in working with our founders, I'm able to like open their minds to things that they could do. And it's just amazing. Like it's a very beautiful thing to watch. Yeah. And it's kind of funny to say because like, okay, yeah, you're building for 10 million users and you're going to, your product is worth X. Mm -hmm. Sure. The product over there is worth maybe one tenth of that X, but Mm -hmm. you're building for a billion users, like you said. Yeah. So if you're building for a billion users, like it's scalable, right? And what then happens is, like with the case of um, Paystack, they were building a Stripe for Africa. And by the time they got to, so you know, Stripe approached them and was like, oh, we like what you're doing. They became strategic, part- strategic partners. And now they acquired, and now Stripe is in Africa because they've acquired their business. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's that opportunity of, we're not at the point where we're going to see a lot of IPOs on the continent yet. That's fair. There's a lot of regulation and government, and like, it's hard. Like, if I tell you, oh, I can tell the, a lot of companies happening in Africa, but guys in the U.S. probably haven't heard about them or don't have that context, right? But what we do see happening is a lot of private equity funds coming in and you know, acquiring our secondaries. We see a lot of mergers and acquisitions. So for us, it's coming in early enough to be able to use the decent return and just exit early because then we can return a fund to our, to our investors and then raise the next fund. So we only plan to stay in the pre-seed and seed stage we have no interest in going to IPO because where we play, we've seen the results and it works for us. Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. It's, it's also like, you know, there's something to be said about teaching the man how to fish instead mm-hmm. of fishing for them. Yeah. And it sounds like you guys are just kind of hit the nail on the head with that one for sure. There's a lot to discuss and there's honestly, I feel like I could just talk to you for hours about this specifically because mm-hmm. it is something that's very, very close to my heart because mm-hmm. again, I was born in Africa. Mm-hmm. How would someone get turned on to you guys and get more information, things like that. Oh, sure. So right now for us, like we just, our first fund was $10 million. Our second fund was about 40. And now our third fund, which we're raising in a year and a half, we're talking about 100 to 150 million. Mm -hmm. So we do have people who we consider friends of the funds um, where we send quarterly newsletters about what we're doing. We also have market trends reports that we do on a monthly basis for people who are interested. So the easy way would be to go to our website, 
which is ingressivecapitalfund.com. And you would see our, um, you can then sign up to be a, like a friend of the fund um, and you start getting our newsletters. Fantastic. Or reach out to me through Fatty. <laughs> I've got a few connections that I want to make. Okay. We're going to talk about this off, offline here. Well, good. Or, Sounds good. Definitely. Yeah. Um, really appreciate this. Like, there's so much to learn. Like I said, there's so much to learn. And the thing about Africa has always been the one content that's sort of like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we do all talk about it, but we don't really talk about it. We don't well, really bring well. enough. And the reason why, although this show is all about businesses within, within Ottawa, mm -hmm. But this is a massive opportunity for a lot of businesses in Ottawa, for a lot of folks in Ottawa to be able to invest abroad and to be able to, you know, at this point that we're living, at this mm -hmm. stage of, of life that we're at, it's a, it's a global economy yeah. that's more like a village. To, and I, I completely agree with that because like one of the things that, so in college years ago, <laughs> there was this, okay, like the world is flat, you know, and they were talking about China and you know, expanding how you can have like, you know, so from China come in to work with you and all of this. With COVID happening, it accelerated the remote world. So it accelerated connections. So now if I can work from anywhere in the world and still deliver, it means I can do business with anyone in the world and still deliver. And you see this if you like, and you see this through Instagram and TikTok, you see this in the music industry, you see the collaboration, like the rise of Afrobeats. Mm -hmm. um, but a boy and Thames and like see them. Man, I've been listening to Afrobeats for <laughs> probably close to twenty some years. Yeah, and you, lately I'm like, they're mainstream. They're mainstream, right? You see this in if you look at Netflix, there's a lot of Korean shows, a lot of African shows, South African, Nigerian, and all, right? That's it. Hence, it's like where the world is going. It's no longer you can't you can succeed by you know being in your bubble, but you go further by working to like working yeah. with other people. So. COVID is really like as bad as it was. It's really open. It's really like broken down barriers between countries. Hundred yeah. percent. It's yeah, yeah, for sure. I feel like COVID <laughs> actually opened up a, a whole other opportunity for so many things. It also changed. It's like a reset. It changed the the way that we, we're thinking yep. as people. Yeah. Like I said, we could talk about this for hours. <laughs> I'd love to kind of uh, you know keep doing this, but obviously yeah. Antonio's got to go. He's got uh, board meeting and the yes. many other things today. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate that we both can make the time to oh, make thanks, this bro. work. And thank, uh, you. thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having for me. Folks that are watching, hey, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe so you can get more and more alerts about episodes like this and people that are uh, doing fantastic things in the city of Ottawa and abroad. And if you like anything in specific. Comment. Let us know. And uh, if there's any business that you think of, let us know as well, too, in the comments, and we can interview them. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. All right.